So here we go with Dr. Wu. Thank you, Don. Uh, thanks to people who are joining here uh, and online. Uh, again, I'm James Wu. It's so nice to be here and have a chance to talk to you in person and online about uh, surgery for thyroid cancer. Uh, I don't have any financial disclosures for this talk. Uh, I am an endocrine surgeon at UCLA. Um, I did my training in head and neck, so I have no particular allegiance to either side. Um, so my objectives for the talk and for today is first, I want to come to a definition of what advanced thyroid cancer is, at least for us today, uh, give patients tips about how to make a plan with their physicians about how to plan for a successful surgery when a more advanced surgery is needed, kind of a brief review of the different surgical approaches we use for advanced thyroid cancer. And then I'm just going to end with a few notes on anaplastic thyroid cancer because there's been some uh, more recent changes about how we approach that particular entity. So uh, for this talk, what do I mean by advanced disease? I, I think there's a lot of ways to define it. Um, in this talk, I'm not so much talking about distant spread or metastasis to other organs. Uh, this is talking about disease that ends up requiring more than a straightforward thyroid lobectomy or total thyroidectomy. So under that, definition, how do we know when thyroid cancer is surgically advanced? Well, there's so, several ways, and I've listed them here in general terms. Either the thyroid cancer itself can extend into the nearby lymph nodes, the tumor itself can extend into the thyroid capsule, into the things that are nearby the thyroid, or a tumor that invades into the lymph nodes can actually extend outside the lymph nodes into the things that the lymph nodes themselves are touching. Fortunately, how we detect these is with thyroid ultrasound. And thyroid ultrasound is really good at finding all of these things. So there's very little surprises by the time we go to the operating room and when we do a good job figuring it out ahead of time. Just briefly to review thyroid ultrasound, this is a picture that some of you may be familiar with, but this is an ultrasound view of the thyroid. You may notice that it is very high definition. I think we have a very clear view into what's going on in the neck. The thing in the middle, the circle labeled T is the trachea. And you can see how the thyroid, the gray part, kind of wraps around the trachea on both the left and the right side. The black stripes above the thyroid are the muscles. And you can see the black circles to either side, which are the carotid artery labeled CCA and the jugular vein labeled JV. I just wanted to give you the quick introduction. I'm going to show you some ultrasound pictures, so she have a reference. So nodal involvement. Nodal involvement is quite easy to detect on ultrasound. The lymph nodes themselves appear like black or gray ovals. Uh, it takes an experienced ultrasonographer to know when something is just reacting, because many things can cause lymph nodes to enlarge, including allergies, vaccines, colds, uh, skin lesions. Uh, but there's a particular appearance that we start to worry about for nodal metastasis from thyroid cancer. And you can see that this actually happens quite often when people present with thyroid cancer. This is data from SEER. Uh, and nationwide, you can see that when people are diagnosed with their thyroid cancer, approximately one third, about 30%, show with nodes already present. And this has been true uh, since 2004, all the way to the current time in 2020. Lymph nodes themselves can be categorized into different areas where they're found. When we talk about them, we often talk about the central neck and we talk about the lateral neck. Central neck nodes are nodes that are bounded on either side by the carotid next to the thyroid on the picture on the left and nodes that are to the side of the carotid all the way out to the ear, those are considered nodes in the lateral neck. The border between central and lateral is just the carotid artery. There's nothing special about the lymph nodes on either side. This is just the way that physicians talk to each other so we can communicate clearly. What I wanna show is, uh, you can see in this paper from Memorial Sloan Kettering that having a neck ultrasound makes a big difference uh, in whether you have a good response to therapy. 
In the column on the left, it said patients that had no good preoperative ultrasound when going to Memorial Sloan Kettering for their thyroid cancer care. And the column on the right is people who did. And they're showing the response to therapy. NED, the column the arrow is pointing to, stands for no evidence of disease. And in the patients that had an ultrasound, 96% had no evidence of disease compared to 88% of the patients who did not have an ultrasound. And why would that make a difference? It's because when you have a good ultrasound telling you where the lymph nodes are, then you can act on them and make sure that you're treating things adequately. Here's another paper showing a very similar kind of finding. This is out of Cleveland Clinic. Um, or I'm sorry, this is with Dr. Sippel out of Wisconsin. Uh, and this shows that in patients who had lateral neck disease, it depended on who was doing the ultrasound because some services have the ultrasound surgeon do their own ultrasound. Some rely on a technician to do it with a radiologist. And you can see that when surgeons do it themselves before the operation, they may be more focused on the lymph nodes. They do a more comprehensive job so that after treatment, you can see that when someone went to an ultrasonographer that was not a surgeon, 12% of those patients had a disease recurrence in the follow-up period where none of the patients who had a surgeon sonographer did. And I think the only way to look at this difference is to think that the surgeons themselves were able to detect all the cases where lymph nodes were involved on the lateral neck and treat them accordingly and not miss them. And this is the one out of Cleveland Clinic uh, with Dr. Sipperstein showing that uh, of all these patients that showed up to Cleveland Clinic, 92 of them who had nodal disease, 45% of those patients, they only were found to have lateral neck disease because the surgeons themselves did their own ultrasound and all the imaging they had leading up to the ultrasound did not prove that there was neck nodes. Uh, I do want to add a quick caveat that, you know, not all nodal involvement is the same. So as I said, 30% of all patients who present with nodal disease, um, but it's not that all of those 30% have a poor prognosis. The bottom arrow on this arrow that we're, many surgeons and physicians are familiar with, this is a graph made by the American Thyroid Association that estimates the risk of recurrence, something growing back after we treat the thyroid cancer for the first time. And you can see that on the lower side, when you have lymph node disease, but either less than five lymph nodes are involved or all the lymph nodes are very small, less than 0.2 centimeters of involvement, the risk of recurrence is still about 5%, fairly low. If you compare that to the arrow above, showing that a lymph node that has grown to a size more than three centimeters, now the risk of recurrence is 30%. So there is a big difference from one nodal disease to the next. So I don't want to give the impression that it's all bad. Another thing that can be uh, a reason that there is surgically advanced disease is something called extra thyroidal extension, growth of the tumor outside of the thyroid. Now, again, you can see the circle with the rings, that's the trachea, the gray, which is the thyroid wrapping around the trachea. And you can see that ball with the arrow is pointing to it with the top of it growing into the muscle that lies right on top of the thyroid. And this is a very clear way that with ultrasound before the surgery, we know that this is more advanced disease. It can also grow the other way. Instead of growing up and towards the muscles, it can grow back and towards the trachea. And you can see, this is another uh, example of that, where you can see the thyroid cancer, there's a very flat imprint against the trachea. And then that tells us that there may be some extension of that tumor onto the trachea itself when that footprint is very flat. Uh, there's no ultrasound images of this, but this phenomenon can also be seen when the cancer has spread to the lymph node and then the lymph node has started to invade into the jugular vein, uh, rarely into the carotid artery uh, or to the recurrent laryngeal nerve. That's harder to see on ultrasound because the nerve is not visible on ultrasound. Rather, you would know that if there were starting to be voice changes and compromise of the recurrent laryngeal nerve because it provides a motor activity to the vocal cord. This is a paper out of our UCLA uh, with senior surgeon Michael Yeh, 
Um, and just like the previous papers I was showing you, this really just reinforces the utility of a surgeon doing their own ultrasound that when a surgeon did an ultrasound and said to the patient, I don't see any evidence of extra thyroid extension, they were correct hundred percent of the time. So when they say, I don't see any evidence of that, you can really trust that result and know that you don't need to escalate the treatment any further. Now the, the converse is not necessarily true. When a surgeon looks at the ultrasound and says, oh, maybe there's extra thyroid extension, they're only right half the time. So there may be a little concern there, but I wouldn't take it as the hard truth. Um, I just showed the same arrow again, all these different things that lead to advanced disease do increase the risk of recurrence between 20 and 40%. But I think it is important in the next few slides, when I start talking about treatment, that we make a distinction between the risk of recurrence, which is just some cancer growing back, possibly needing another operation with surviving from the thyroid cancer. Because as you can see, this is the AJCC staging, the eighth edition, which is the most recent. And for patients who are under 55 years of age, it is, doesn't matter what the T stage is or the end stage, patients can only be stage one or two. And on the graph on the right, you can see the survival over 20 years of these patients. And so even when uh, there are these advanced features, uh, we're really fighting against the thyroid cancer growing back, but I think uh, we can still reassure our patients that with good treatment, that the overall prognosis is still favorable. Uh, it does become a little bit higher risk when we reach down into stages three and four down the bottom of the graph. And in the table, you can see that when patients are over 55 years of age, uh, you can see T4B, which is growth into the trachea or things behind the thyroid or distant metastases is when survival actually starts to dip. Short of that, people's uh, overall survival is still very good. And then another point is that in thyroid cancer, the risk is very dynamic. It can change. This was uh, created by Dr. Michael Tuttle from Memorial Kettering. He's a very uh, famous endocrinologist. And he came up with this idea of response to therapy and how that changes the risk. So at the top of this table, you can see that they took all these patients and categorized them by the ATA initial risk when they're looking at how big is the tumor, how many lymph nodes are involved, and they're giving that risk estimate from the arrow, what is the chance of something growing back? And if you get categorized as low, it's 3%. And if you get categorized as high, 66%. But that doesn't look at how patients responded to therapy. Now, if you look below, there's these categories of response. I include them here. I know it's kind of hard to read really quickly, but just know that there's different categories, excellent, acceptable, incomplete. And if you look across the row of people with excellent response, if you started off as ATA intermediate, we would tell you your risk of recurrence is 18%. But after treatment, if we check your thyroid globulin and it's undetectable, we check your ultrasound and we don't see any evidence of disease, and you have an excellent response, now your risk of recurrence is 2%, very different than that 18% that we initially estimated. Same thing even in the high-risk category, where if you have an excellent response, then now your new risk is 14%. So it's not like these things are static from the beginning. They do happen to change over time. Just a quick summary of all those points we just went through that an ultrasound, especially when performed by your surgeon, is a reliable, accurate test especially to tell you if you have advanced disease or not and whether you need to think about the things I'm about to talk about. Secondly, that advanced disease does raise the risk of recurrence, but it doesn't mean that it decreases your chances of surviving from the cancer and that your risk level can change depending on the quality of the treatment. So some tips about how to prepare um, as a patient and talking to your physician uh, for these more advanced surgical procedures if you happen to need them. And the first point I, we kind of already talked about that the, the first part of the care is making sure we have a full comprehensive map of what's going on. And a lot of that involves a very comprehensive ultrasound by the surgeon. 
following that, I'll have all these slides. Some patients need an examination of their vocal cords with laryngoscopy to see if their vocal cords are moving or not before the surgery. And I'll tell you why that makes a big difference. Sometimes patients do need CT or MRI, although that's rare. And then even more rare than that, a bronchoscopy or endoscopy, which means using a camera to look inside the throat uh, at the lesions from the inside. So flexible laryngoscopy, what is it? Um, some of you may have had it, some not. Um, it is uh, something that divides the different specialties because I believe that most head and neck surgeons uh, do do this more liberally than endocrine surgeons. Uh, but what it is, it's an office procedure, doesn't require any anesthesia, although some people do spray some numbing agent into the nose. And you pass this little noodle through the nose into the back of the throat, and you can look at the vocal cords and see if they're moving. The reason why we do this is because some thyroid cancers can affect the recurrent laryngeal nerve, and we want to know if that nerve has been paralyzed or not before going into the surgery. And you can see in this paper that I quoted, uh, some people argue that we should reserve laryngoscopy for when patients tell us, oh, I think my voice has changed. My voice has changed recently. And is this a good way to judge whether we should do laryngoscopy or not? In this paper, they found that when they went by this strategy of asking patients whether they experienced a change in their voice, they found that they were doing a lot of laryngoscopies that were ultimately normal uh, because patients can detect really subtle changes in their own voice, but the result of our current laryngeal nerve compromise is usually more dramatic than that. And so it's usually best to go based off on the surgeon's assessment of whether there's been a dramatic change in hoarseness of voice. The other big caveat to that is that a lot of people can compensate for one side being paralyzed and they were hoarse for a little bit and then their voice is totally normal. To them, it's normal. To their family and friends, it's normal. But if you look inside, the nerve has actually been already compromised and they've just compensated. And so that leads to a lot of disagreement between specialties about whether you should do it every time, whether you should do it sometimes, because people are worried about missing some paralyzed cords before going into surgery. Even to right now, there's not a big agreement on when it should be done. In my practice, in our practice, I think the reasonable compromise is that when you do an ultrasound, if you think a tumor is large and close to the nerve and there's a risk of it being compromised, then do a laryngoscopy. Of course, if you sense a very large difference in the patient's voice, they sound very hoarse, or the patients themselves tell you they were very hoarse for a short period of time and it got better, those are all good reasons to go ahead and do the laryngoscopy. The reason why it matters so much is because it changes the risk of the operation quite a bit. Because when you go into a surgery, and one vocal cord is paralyzed because the nerve is compromised. And again, when we do a thyroidectomy, there's usually about a five to 7% risk of a temporary nerve injury. A temporary nerve injury, we say, it's okay. You just have a hoarse voice. And most of the time it'll get better on its own. But when both vocal cords are paralyzed, that is a much different problem because when there is no opening for you to breathe through, that can lead to airway compromise, and that could require a tracheostomy. So if you have one side when the nerve is already paralyzed and you operate on the other, then that patient is taking on a 5% risk of having a temporary injury on the side that's still working and could have airway compromise. And so this is why uh, making sure we know what's going on with the vocal cords before surgery, especially advanced surgery, is really important. Well, what about getting CT scans or MRI scans? I think the majority of us feel very comfortable with ultrasound. Ultrasound is the first thing we should do and usually tells us everything we need to know. And I think it's up to the surgeon's judgment about whether if the lymph node disease is so extensive or there's parts of the neck that they don't think they can see well, whether they need a CT or MRI scan. The CT or MRI, all its function is to help give the surgeon a better roadmap to how to do a comprehensive surgery. Now, a lot of endocrinologists in the past used to push back against this and say, well, do you really need that CT scan? Do you really need to give IV contrast? Because there was a theoretical concern that if you gave contrast, the contrast has a large, large amount of iodine. 
And because many patients, especially patients with advanced disease, need radioactive iodine after the surgery, we thought that we were going to interfere or delay that treatment. Turns out, in these two papers you can see here, uh, that these are both published in thyroid. Our fears were not totally uh, con confirmed, and that as long as you give it one month of time, that all of the iodine from the contrast washes out and everything goes back to normal. So if a surgeon is telling you, I think that I would be helped a lot by getting a CT scan, you should not worry about getting it. Uh, finally, I talked about whether we need to do bronchoscopy or laryng uh, or endoscopy to look inside the throat or the esophagus for things coming through on the other side. It's only necessary when we think that there's extra thyroidal extension that goes back into the trachea, into the esophagus. This is a very dramatic example. Uh, you can see on the CT scan that the tumors start to grow into the trachea. And when you look inside, it's pooching through. The reason why this adds so much information is because you know that when you go into the surgery, you're going to need to remove that entire wall of trachea in order to clear the disease. And that's not something you want to be surprised about. You want to be prepared to do that when you're in the time of surgery. Um, a lot of patients always ask, you know, how do we know it hasn't spread outside of my neck? You're only getting things of my neck, the ultrasound, CT, MRI. Um, and the honest answer is that we oftentimes wait and do the surgery first. And that's because for differentiated thyroid cancers, the most common type being papillary or follicular, for those thyroid cancers, we rely on the number of thyroglobulin or a radioiodine scan afterwards to tell us if there's any spread. And so we typically wait on imaging other parts of the body until after the surgery. Okay, so moving on to the final part, which is surgical approaches, and more importantly than the like little technical details about how we do the surgery, is about you know how a surgeon thinks through these operations and how, as patients, you can best talk to your surgeon to kind of communicate your values because the surgeon is trying to make a lot of difficult choices on your behalf, and the more that there is a shared decision-making, I think there's a better outcome. So with that in mind, talking about goals of treatment with the physician is very important because there's different goals and sometimes they can conflict with each other because sometimes patients' goals is to clear all disease or sometimes you can say, we don't want to get all of it. Maybe we can just clear most of the disease and that will help with REI treatment or other treatment. And that way we can at least preserve my voice, keep that intact or preserve other function if it's grown into other structures. So a very, very common dilemma in the OR is you're operating, uh, you see that the tumor has invaded the recurrent laryngeal nerve, but because you've done a good assessment preoperatively, you know the voice is normal. So you're faced with a choice. Either you can just cut the nerve out because you know there's tumor in it, and that, that will, it will clear all the disease and decrease the risk of recurrence. Or you can cut off most of the cancer cells as much as you can see, but leave the nerve working so that the patient's voice is normal. And when you're faced with this choice, I think the only person who can make the best choice for the patient is the patient. And that's why it's really important to establish goals of treatment before going to the OR. But these dilemmas commonly come up in these advanced cases. And you know, this is the brief overview of just all the risks of these procedures that are needed for advanced disease. If we're doing a thyroidectomy, these are very common hoarseness, difficulty swallowing, low calcium because of compromise of the parathyroid glands. If you do a central neck dissection, removing the neck nodes, then you have a higher risk of hoarseness by injuring the recurrent laryngeal nerve or low calcium by accidentally removing the parathyroid. Then you go into the lateral neck and then there's a lot more nerves out there that you could injure that could cause shoulder weakness, paralysis of the hemidiaphragm or part of the tongue. And of course, the most invasive procedures like removing the larynx, uh, these have very dramatic effects on people's overall quality of life. And these are important things to discuss when talking about our goals. So in terms of a surgical approach, it's pretty straightforward for nodal metastases. If you find nodes on ultrasound that are in the central neck, then you clear all the nodes from the central neck. If you find nodes in the lateral neck, you clear all the loads from the lateral neck, 
because you want to try to catch all of the cells that are trying to walk away from the thyroid as best you can. It's up to the surgeon, whether they include a central neck dissection, if the nodes are only in the lateral neck. This is just a little bit more detail about these. When you do a central neck dissection, the incision is the same size as when you do a thyroidectomy. We're just removing fatty tissue between the artery and the trachea. We actually can't see and count the nodes. We're just removing all the fat. And the pathologist counts the nodes after we are done removing it. Our job is to find and protect the recurrent laryngeal nerve, but because we're working on it, there's more risk to it. And oftentimes the parathyroid looks like a piece of fat and you take it out by accident. Lateral neck uh, dissections, you, they require a longer incision or incisions. Some people like to do it through two. Some just do one long one, but they do go all the way up to the ear. We remove all the fatty tissue from the carotid all the way out to almost the ear. And our job as a surgeon is to find these nerves and protect them. Experience is really the key in terms of performing these neck dissections. Here are just two short papers, one looking at what is the minimum threshold to minimize complications from the surgery. And uh, this paper found that surgeons who did at least seven per year of central necks or at least three per year of lateral necks have better complication rates. And it's not very high, but it's an important and easy question you can ask your surgeon, how many of these do you do each year? to protect yourself from a higher rate of complications. And the second one, it's talking not about complication rate, but actually cancer outcomes. Do they actually do a better job of moving more of the cancer comprehensively? And you can see that the highest volume surgeons in the blue are the ones who do at least 20 a year, still not a really high number. It's an easy bar to meet uh, versus the more lower volume surgeons. So volume definitely is key. Reoperations, because a lot of patients with advanced disease end up going numerous reoperations. They're different from the first approach that I just mentioned. Uh, operating too soon can carry a risk because lesions that are too small, if you have a lymph node under a centimeter that you biopsy it, you prove it's cancer, you go in and try to get it. Sometimes you may miss it if it's too small because it's hard to detect. The dissections are usually kept more limited because more scar tissue makes the area more dangerous. You don't know exactly where the nerves and everything are and you want to avoid injuring them. So you only go for the things that you have proven to be cancer. And at a certain point, you may decide the operating is too dangerous and you may consider one of these more minimally invasive options instead that don't work as well, but cause less harm. In terms of how to deal, we just talked about with nodal disease, this is about how to deal when there's extra thyroidal extension. One quick note is that extra thyroidal extension is different when it's gross versus microscopic. So what does that mean? So when you get a pathology report that says microscopic extra thyroidal extension, that is extra thyroidal extension only seen by the pathologist. And it's included on the pathology report. They can see on under the microscope that the thyroid cancer cells have broken past the capsule and are walking towards the muscle or other structures. This is different from when the surgeon sees it and says in the operating room, the cancer is sticking to things. This is just a quick paper, again, out of Memorial Sloan Kettering, showing that microscopic extrathyroidal extension does not impact outcomes. So when you see extrathyroidal extension on your pathology report, but the surgeon says, I looked and there was no extension of the tumor outside the thyroid, then you can know that uh, that clinically is the same as having no extrathyroidal extension. So what matters most in this case is what the surgeon sees, not is what reported uh, by the pathologist on the microscope. Uh, so the surgical approach when there's extrathyroidal extension does change based on which other structures are being invaded. Uh, if it's just going into the overlying muscle, which is a common area, the key to this is having a surgeon just simply recognize that the cancer is starting to invade and get real sticky to the muscle. The approach to this is really simple. You just remove the strap muscle along with the thyroid. Uh, we call it end block. Uh, in the, that way, you just ensure that there's no cancer cells left behind that are around the area. And so far, there's been no apparent side effects to removing the strap muscles. This has been studied pretty extensively because some surgeons like to cut the strap muscles as part of surgery, some don't. Uh, 
they've tried to look at whether it affects swallowing. There's some suggestion it does affect swallowing in older patients, but uh, the data is still a little inconclusive. So extrathyroid extension into muscle, uh, relatively easy to approach. Uh, the key is just making sure that the surgeon recognizes it. What happens if it extends into the trachea? Um, the, the key is recognition before you go into the OR and preparing for it. Sometimes you get surprised and you're in the OR, there is a tumor there and you're trying to remove from the trachea. Normally it separates pretty easily, but it just seems very firmly planted and attached. In those situations, it's probably best for the surgeon to stop, collect some information, make a plan, but don't go for a more aggressive resection that has not been discussed with the patient. It's always good at that time to perform a bronchoscopy if needed to look inside the trachea, just like that picture I showed earlier to confirm whether or not there's any extension through and through the trachea to the inside. Because if so, then you may need to come back and remove that segment of trachea to clear all the disease. Um, that is called a trachea resection and up to five centimeters of trachea can be removed and the ends connected back together uh, to have a good outcome. This is not always needed. Sometimes cancers are simply plastered onto the trachea and you can shave them off and observe. So this requires a thorough discussion with the surgeon afterwards if it's seen. What happens when the nerve is invaded either by extra thyroidal extension or extra nodal extension? Well, so this is again, it goes really important to the fact that you need to know what the nerves are doing before the operation. Because if you know that both nerves were working when you go into the OR and you know that they're going to work, if it looks like the nerve is going to be intact, then I think that you want to remove as much of the tumor as possible, but try to leave the nerve intact. All of, many of us use nerve monitors. You can know if it's actually conducting electricity. And if it's conducting electricity as normal, just leave it alone. If it lost conduction, you can consider uh, stopping there and giving it time to recover because it may recover in the post-operative period. And if you think one side will recover, I think many surgeons will consider not operating on the other side of the thyroid if it hasn't been touched yet at that moment. And I know this is really tough for patients because they've already gotten themselves to a point where they've come, they wanted their entire thyroid out, they've come for this big operation, and it's really disappointing to have to come back for a second operation. But again, this is about protecting the patient, uh, despite the patient maybe being disappointed in you as a surgeon, because if you decide to power through and say, well, one side's not working, but I'm pretty sure I can go to the other side and do it very safely is what some surgeons may tell ourselves. There's always that risk of a five to 7% chance of a temporary injury of that nerve. And again, if both sides are not working, then that patient may have airway compromise and need a tracheostomy. And that is a really high risk, especially if you've not talked to the patient about the risk of tracheostomy. So I think in those cases, better to stop. If the nerve is not functional and you already knew that before surgery, or sometimes they're just not salvageable, it's thoroughly eaten through by tumor, then you do sacrifice the nerve. And at that time, then you do go ahead and do the other side, even though there's that risk of a tracheostomy. And the reason is, is because in the first scenario, when there's a chance the other side may recover, if that nerve recovers and you come back, then the risks are totally different because now there's no risk of needing a tracheostomy because you're not going to operate on that side that's already been operated on before. The worst you're going to get is hoarseness. Uh, but in this case, no matter how much time you've given it because you've already sacrificed the nerve, the risks are going to be the same. So it may be better to just complete the operation at that point. And finally, when a nerve is cut, it's usually good to graft it onto other nerves if possible. This may re require calling in some help from plastic surgery uh, or ENT or other services if they're not familiar with nerve grafting. But grafting it to other nerves, like the ansa cervicalis, doesn't restore its function. The vocal cord itself is not going to work the way that we want it to, but, but just by connecting it to another nerve, it actually helps the vocal cord from thinning out and atrophying and actually improves voice outcomes, even with that nerve cut. So it's another important thing to consider.
And finally, uh, in the, this is the probably more of the more rare cases, uh, what happens if there's invasion into the larynx itself, not into just the trachea? Uh, this is obviously the wrong picture because this is going into the trachea. So if it's going into the larynx, then patients uh, may need what's known as a laryngectomy, which is removal of where the Adam's apple is in a man, the thyroid cartilage with the vocal cords all together. And then there's this discontinuity where the breathing will, the trachea will just be brought out through the skin as a permanent tracheostomy. People will still eat and swallow like normal because we'll keep the esophagus where it is. But now you've taken out the voice box and patients have to talk in a completely different way. I think that when there's this very rare situation, the first thing that needs to happen is a multi forming a multidisciplinary team. And that whole team needs to give the patient their best advice about if we take on this very large and radical surgery, what are the chances you're going to have a good outcome? What is your life going to be like? It's really important for patients to meet with speech therapy beforehand to talk about what life is like without a larynx. What is it like to you know, try to talk through your esophagus or use the electrolarynx just so the patient can make an informed decision about whether they want to take on this very large surgery. Because in the end of the day, depending on the patient's age, how bad it is, whether there's other spread, you may choose to do a very radical procedure in trying to clear all the disease versus lesser procedures more focused on making the patient feel better. Finally, just a few slides on anaplastic thyroid cancer, then I'm happy to answer some questions. Uh, about anaplastic thyroid cancer, this is a very aggressive but rare high-risk subtype of thyroid cancer. You know, Previously, one-year survival for this is 20 to 35%, five-year survival, five to 14%, dramatically different than papillary follicular thyroid cancers. And in, whenever we see this, you, we used to think to ourselves, we're just going to focus on palliation because cure is really difficult. Usually the only times we would cure anaplastic thyroid cancer is when we did it by accident. When there's like a very small nodule, we've already cut it out completely. And we find after the fact that it's anaplastic. But thankfully there's been a huge paradigm shift in anaplastic thyroid cancer. So a lot of this research came out of MD Anderson and they continue to publish uh, their data on this. But the fantastic thing is that now they're for patients with a very specific mutation, uh, BRAF V600E, uh, uh, and this is uh, a common mutation found in anaplastic thyroid cancers and other ca papillary thyroid cancers, that there is these small molecules, the brafinib, trametinib, which specifically target this mutation. And so what they've shown is that when anybody presents with anaplastic thyroid cancer, that now we rush to send for genetic testing. And this sometimes we need a second biopsy to do so. Uh, another new way is to just do staining uh, of the cells for this mutation. And if you prove that it's there, then those patients are eligible for this targeted therapy. And this is the publication from MD Anderson. You can see these PET scans from these patients the before and after. And there is this very dramatic response of disease that is already very widespread and everywhere. And it goes quiet on the PET scan. And once that they, we are sure of their response to therapy, then we think that there's a possibility of removing all disease with surgery, then it's possible to entertain the idea of doing surgery. And with this approach, they've really been able to extend the uh, median survival for all these patients to the point where uh, Mark Zafario, the head neck surgeon, uh, just presented this at the latest American Thyroid Association meeting. And they were saying that for their latest series, they haven't even been able to calculate the median survival because their patients are still alive with anaplastic thyroid cancer. Now it's really tough because um, we test for the BRAF mutation. Some patients really do hang their hat on finding that mutation so that we can try that therapy, but what if we don't identify it? Then I think then we do have to have a careful consideration of not operating because there's a real risk of doing too much to patients with anaplastic thyroid cancer that, uh, especially as a fellow at Memorial, uh, we saw many patients who 
uh, surgeons would try to do a surgery, they would get, you know, 98, 99% of the cancer that was there. But before the wounds are healed, the cancer has grown back larger than it was metastasized to other places. And it really taught us that uh, doing that is futile. And we're just wasting people's time that they could spend uh, spending time with their loved ones or doing the things that they want to do. And uh, same thing about doing a tracheostomy because some of these grow very large and start to interfere with people's breathing. We thought that we could help people by putting in a breathing tube, a tracheostomy so that they don't suffocate. But uh, the honest is that I think that we've learned that that actually compromises many people's quality of life because now they have to, they lose their voice. They have to use uh, frequent suctioning devices. There's complications associated with the tracheostomy as well. And that I think there needs to be a very informed uh, discussion with the patient about whether that should be done, or we should just try not to interfere with people's lives in that way. And there can also be a discussion about clinical trials, radiation therapy, immunotherapy, uh, other things that may work. All right. So the, that's the end of my uh, slides and talk. Um, happy to take uh, any questions. Dr. Wu, thank you. What a great presentation. I have a, just a few questions. How frequently is there a tracheal invasion in your professional opinion? How frequently does that happen? Um, so the question was, how often do we see tracheal invasion? Um, I'll be honest with you. I don't have the statistic like in my brain, right. but I do know that it's quite rare that, um, you know, in at least the past five years, uh, I've only seen, uh, two cases of, of tracheal invasion needing a tracheal resection. And that's being at, uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering, then UCLA, where we see, probably upwards of, you know, 500 to a thousand cases a year. So it kind of tells you the rate is, you know, well below, you know, fractions of a percent. And when you, uh, when you spoke of five centimeters of the removal of the tracheal trachea, mm -hmm. your estimation again, how many rings would that be? Um, so, you know, a ring of trachea is probably uh, two to three millimeters in its height. Uh, so I guess if we calculate out, it's quite a number of rings that you could remove, yes. um, but five centimeters is really stretching the limit and, uh, you have to really uh, get creative sometimes on how people will cut the trachea in ways to elongate it, to get to the full five centimeters. I would say that in that rare case, when there is tracheal invasion and you need to do a trachea resection, it's actually quite rare for the footprint to be that wide and that the part that it actually eats through the trachea is shorter than that. I think the point of discussion, usually when there's tracheal invasion is not so much, is it possible to remove? It's whether it's better to, and less morbid, uh, less complications for the patient to simply cut off what we can see and just leave that wall of trachea with a few cancer cells there, knowing that there's cancer cells there. And you can try to treat those cells with radioactive iodine you can try to treat it with radiation versus going for the gold, which is trying to clear every single cancer cell. You know, for me and how I think about it, usually it's younger, very healthy patients. They have no disease anywhere else. And we really think that just by doing the extra aggressive surgery, we're going to get better clearance is when we'll do these tracheal resections. I think for other patients, um, we'd probably favor taking a more conservative approach. Gotcha. Will your slides be available on the site with your presentation? Um, uh, if they're not, I'm happy to share them with you. We have a couple of questions online. The first one is, how many doctors, surgeons do their own ultrasound? This is from Greg. Um, so I think that the practice patterns are very varied, and they can vary even inside of one institution. Um, and so what I'll say is that uh, at... Uh, when I was at Memorial Sloan Kettering, I found that there were some that did it every time themselves. Other ones would have a chat with the radiologist. Um, and uh, at UCLA, I think we have an ultrasound in every clinic room and we do all our own. Uh, the percentage is probably moving towards more people doing their own. 
because ultrasounds are smaller and smaller. You can buy ones that like fit in your pocket and they're less expensive. Um, but I think uh, the best way to know uh, for a patient is just simply to ask because they'll, they'll tell you. Anybody else in the room here like a question? Okay, we have another question online from Patty. I have cancer in the larynx and I'm looking for a surgeon who is qualified for partial laryng laryngectomy. Um, so uh, that is a tough situation to have. So a partial laryngectomy or removal of part of the thyroid cartilage and then removal of one vocal cord is a, a more um, historic uh, uh, operation almost for like textbooks. Um, I've only seen one and I wasn't the one performing it. It was a senior attending. And even when the senior attending was doing it, they themselves were kind of astounded that they were doing it. And I think everybody else uh, was similarly uh, dubious about the procedure. Uh, and I think that's because compared to everything else, uh, it uh, has not shown to have excellent outcomes. And we were almost forced to in that position because we were a little desperate. Um, the reason why a partial laryngectomy is not as good, in my opinion, uh, is because you're kind of trying to walk between two different avenues. One, if you want to go for clearing all the disease uh, and you're okay with losing some voice, uh, then a total laryngectomy is a good procedure. Um, I've had several patients who've undergone total laryngectomies, have no evidence of disease, so it's possible to get a great outcome afterwards. And you can live you know, a, a, a still a good life, although different than the one before. I think that if the goal is not to achieve that, but instead to just try to get as many good quality years of life without doing a big operation, then I would recommend against doing a partial laryngectomy, which still has many of the same complications, if not more as a total laryngectomy, and instead just use other things like uh, radioactive iodine, radiation therapy, or maybe even trying things like immunotherapy. Okay, for those that are present here in the room, if you'd like to stick around, Dr. Wu has agreed to speak to you privately if you wish. And again, Dr. Wu, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, Thaika, thanks you. Thanks for all your attention.